The following podcast contains strong language. Hello, and welcome back to the Cine Rambles podcast. You're listening to Nick and Andrew, and we'll be talking all things film for the next hour or so. So, how have we been? Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, we saw Call of the Wild. Yep, which we'll be reviewing. about two hours ago. Yep, it's all right, fresh on the mind to talk about. We've got plenty to say. Yeah. Uh, also, Underwater, I've seen early this week, which we'll be talking about. So I haven't seen that. No, so that but, I've, on you. but it does link into your discussion on Cosmic Horror. So I think yes. you'll have some input, hopefully, yeah. towards the end. Yeah. Cool. And then well, you've also got a, a new segment for us. Yeah, That's hopefully, if we've got time, That's we're going it. to do... A fundamental. Ooh, <laughs> hey. We need to make jingles for that. Yeah. So some follow-ups to last episode, when we were talking about cosmic horror, I found out, um, doing some research on my own the other night, there's another, there's a German adaptation of Colour Out of Space uh, for 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it interesting, they, it's shot in black and white, but where the colour, the only colour in it is the colour from outer space, which I think is an interesting way around it. That's actually genius. Yeah, because then in this these this sort of this world, it really is this colour outside their spectrum, and then it, that makes it alien. That's actually incredible. That's, yeah. that's genius. I want to see that. Now. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's got about a thousand or so votes on IMDb, so it's not too obscure. But I'm, I want to track down a copy of that now, because that sounds like a really good way around it. Yeah, like genuinely, that that's one of the only ways I can really think to fix that problem. Mm. Yeah, that, that's good, right? Maybe yeah. we can do a little... <laughs> Review yeah, on that if we can get our hands the, on it. The new Nicolas Cage one comes out. Maybe we could yes. try and watch both and compare them. Yeah. Potentially. I, I take it it's in German. Yes, I think so. That's okay. what, I think that's what it said, yeah. Um, and otherwise, in film news, I found out there's a new little shop of horrors film. Oh, is there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, with Chris Evans has now been cast as the dentist, Oren Scrivello. Okay. Yeah. Which, that's an interesting choice. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> but I, I mean... I saw this, it was on Empire, on the articles, they like, oh yes, Chris Evans has been cast in a new Little Shop of Horrors. And I was like, sorry, there's a new Little Shop of Horrors? <laughs> don't, don't, don't let that one scoot past. What do you mean there's a new one? It is a film, then. Yes, I think, I, it, I He's wasn't... not just going to be in the play or whatever. No, 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 they're making a new film adaptation. Apparently, um, I think it's Scarlett Johansson and... And Robert Downey Jr. No, I can't remember who it was, uh, who they've been considered for Seymour and um, Audrey. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, it's sort of in early stages of talks. But I I'm think... guessing it won't be a musical then. Well, that's the thing, because it's... I mean, the, the article wasn't clear. I looked at yeah. the Hollywood Reporter, which was the original source for it. Yeah. It didn't specify, but it mentioned the musical in terms of, like, you know, where the films come from. So I assume, yeah, yeah. maybe, it might. maybe they're going to do, like, a CGI remake of it, which scares me as a concept. That's yeah. Cool. The puppet's so good. Well, that's the thing, because I've I mean, read a lot of stuff about the original puppet, and it's genuinely like a, a work of, of almost magic, the stuff they did with yeah. just practical effects. Like, the amount of work and effort that went to that original puppet was so incredible. Having, having like... I haven't seen the whole film recently, but I was looking up just some bits of Audrey, and, you know, but the puppetry is incredible, like, especially the mouth movement and how it sings so incredibly well. Like, and that's just... Weird to think how good yeah. it is. Also, there's like um, specifically in the um, feed me song number. Yeah, there's several parts what where song? <laughs> essentially did it like almost like a live action stop motion, and to have like um, Rick Moranis essentially act like frame by frame with the plant, and it still looks convincing when spelled like that's such a talent, and would take so much time and preparation to get right. Wow. But yeah, it's like there's so many things like that in the original, which I think is just really fascinating. Speaking of Rick Moranis. Oh yeah. He they're rebooting Honey I Shrunk the Kids. Oh yes, I did see he's this. He's coming back. Oh. <laughs> which is a thing, I guess. I guess, yeah. How old is he? He must be pretty old now. He must be fifty, sixty odd, I'd imagine. Yeah. Surely, yeah. He hasn't been in anything in ages, has he? No, I thought he's sort of like semi retired almost. Yeah. But, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, that's that about wraps up for the the news section. Um but cool. also if if anyone has any comments or questions they'd like read out on the show, you can drop us a comment on YouTube. Or send us an email at cinerambles at gmail.com and we can discuss it in this section before we start reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but now, on to Call of the Wild. Yes. So what was your initial reaction then? Okay, so overall, I thought it's no high art. No. But I thought, for what it was, it was actually quite... It was an entertaining little bit of yarn. Flawed, but considering it's about 
a dog that just goes on like a you know a family adventure kind of thing. It's fine. Yeah, I thought it was fine. Like we were just after we came out the cinema, me and Nick were discussing this, and I said I would give it five out of ten. Yeah, very run of mill. Like it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. Like it was, it was fine. No, but I think this is. I think the the main com- uh, conversation to be had with it. Is about the dog. Yeah, the Adam CGI dog. dog. Adam dog, a dog. Yeah. Um. So, that was where I like. I found myself laughing at bits that were supposed to be dramatic, and I think. I mean, I don't know. It's because they were trying to overly humanize this dog, but also the score and the camera movement and everything was so melodramatic. And at the end of the day, you are watching a CGI dog, and it just made me laugh. So yeah. my this is the thing about humanizing a dog because I had similar thoughts when watching it yeah. about dogs don't act this way, this is too human. But then of course there were a lot of bits like that that actually mm. it was just like the plot wouldn't work without it, but it would be so much better if you, especially like so Harrison Ford's character like all drinks the alcohol and you know because he's a morning father like oh that's fine and the dog's like oh no don't drink alcohol and keeps taking his alcohol bottles like the dog wouldn't know that no dog would know that it's just what the f- <laughs> why well exactly well this is the thing because then it's like well yes but then if a story because if they would acted exactly like a real dog then a lot of a story wouldn't work and so I was, I was reminded of things like so for example Finding Nemo mm. that's not how fishes act no but then human- that's but that's the thing, because yeah. that's animation, so we that's give that the say. benefit of the bat doubt, like we are in a different universe. But, but I think because Call of the Wild is mainly live action, I think that's why it's more incongruous. But also they're trying so hard with the dog and the CGI to be photorealistic that mm. when it does human things or non-dog-like things, it feels even weirder. Yeah. Which is why I said they should either have gone fully, uh, you know, made the whole thing an animation. Like you said, like, you know another Disney Frozen-esque thing where they could have done a full animation and that would have worked a lot better because as we said there's a lot of moments in this that are very cartoonish that are trying to you know make it the more family friendly mm. but they're, they're just they're so different they're so you know out of place in the rest of the world that it just feels silly and stupid and out of place yeah, in particular, I found there was a problem specifically with, like, I guess, the weight of the dog. Yeah. Like, considering it is, it was, what, a St. Bernard Scotch... Sheep dog. Scotch sheep dog mix. Yeah. Like, it's it's an absolutely chunky dog. Yeah, it's like yeah. a it's a unit. Like, they're yeah. huge dogs. And yet, we there are several scenes where it's, like, bouncing around in sort of quite an elastic, cartoony way. And I'm like, it, it's not... It's a massive yeah. dog. It wouldn't be able to jump like also, that. Also, there's, there's bits where it's like, oh... It, it, they just seemingly change its size, strength, energy to just fit whatever the story needs. And it's like so inconsistent. That annoyed me as well. Especially when it's with the other dogs, which are pulling the sled. Yeah. Uh, is it pack dogs? The, the, yeah. Yeah. The sled dogs. Yeah. Sled dogs, that's the word. <laughs> of course. <Yeah. laughs> but, um, you know, we see these other dogs, which are like comparatively a normal size. I and mean, then this absolute unit. And like, yes, it's a big dog, but it's not. This much bigger than other sled dogs, which are also normally big dogs. Yeah. Like the the head of it, it's a it's a husky called yeah. S- Spitz. Yeah. Spitz. And huskies are, are big dogs. Yeah. And, it's, and it's he's dogs. like what like you know half the size again of this yeah. of this dog. And exactly. Like, so he's huge, but then at the same time, it's like the the overhumanization was was bad to the point where they it withdrew from me because at the end of the, like it's an animal it's supposed to be an animal there's so many times where he buck is the dog's name i don't think we mentioned that no um but does these things or you know doesn't do something that an animal would just absolutely do yes it's like it is a dog so there's a bit early on where uh, um buck gets kidnapped and he's on a train and a character threatens to hit him with a stick and then does hit him with the stick and I think the dog you know he's like growling and barking at him it's like that dog would just go for you and it's the size you know of the train it could just absolutely have you why would it not do that and it's like oh because it it's humanizing it it's like oh it's teaching it to sit down it's like no you've captured this dog it would go 
mental and just rip your throat out. <laughs> Did you say Buck was the size of a train? Yes. I would love to see a film with like a giant <laughs> train-sized dog terrorising Milan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be cute. Yeah. What's well, the other thing? There, there wasn't... There was a lot less than I thought there was, like, trying to make him really cute, like, mm. cutesy as well. There was one moment where I thought he was going to do, you know, the Puss in Boots thing, Massive eyes. Massive eyes. But they sort of did that, but only for a couple of seconds. I was like, okay. But I thought that was quite good, because I, I was sort yeah, of yeah. afraid it would be too much like, oh, look at the doggy. Look, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a doggy. Oh, and I'm glad it didn't go that way. Yeah, moment. I'm glad it didn't as well, because I, I, was, I was a bit wary of that. Like, I thought the whole time it would just be like, oh, look how cute this dog is. And there is a couple of moments where you're like, oh, that's sweet, but it's still not like... In fact, overall, because I mean, the dog yeah. is the protagonist. Yes. But I, I like that even though he is like the centre of the film, this like this main USP, mm. there's not there's not too much of just like... It, they sort of just get on with it in terms of him being the lead protagonist. Like, there's not yeah. as much as I'd feared just general of like, look at him, he's being a dog. Look at him doing dog things. He's sort of like... Yeah. That's almost the opposite of the problem. He's too human. He's yeah. just He just yeah, is yeah. a protagonist of the story. Yeah. Also, there was the uh, weird magic black ghost wolf. Yeah, it's a spirit eyes. guide. It's spirit. Yeah, but what? <laughs> well, you know, it's I guess visual that's art the form. the call. End <laughs> 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 oh, that's um, not a spoiler. <laughs> yeah, sure. Harrison Ford was good. Harrison Ford was good. I mean, I think he was uh, probably the best part of it. Actually, you reckon? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the. the CGI was good and Buck was fine, but I th- feel like he elevated it. Yeah, I mean, I thought there were points where his performance was quite hammy. Like when he was sending you the the letter, where he stops the sled to be like, "I've got another letter," I felt oh, like he right. wasn't trying in that scene much. Well, Later on, he was fine. Yeah, but in that one, he seemed a bit like, "Have you got space for one more letter?" <laughs> it's yeah. for my son. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Early on, but then later, the more it got yeah. into it, I feel like he was he was very good. Also, he's in remarkably good shape for a seventy year old man. Or close to eighty. Yeah. 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 I thought also um, the other thing I want to commend about the film is there's several sequences. Um, there's one in particular of like a, the when he, there's the sled dog scarf at the night and have basically have a sort of a, um, I guess a dog fight. For but you know for power and the, you know sort of the yeah the, this it's husky like deciding the alpha is yeah. yeah and the husky competes with Buck and I I found that sequence was actually quite essentially a silent cinema sequence there's no dialogue at all unless you count barking and growling as dialogue <laughs> but I don't but I I thought that was actually because and you know there was a narration going and now they compete to be the I was like yes I know yeah. I got that see that moment. I feel like would have been so much better without the narration, but for me, the narration ruined it. Like you, because you have the the narration was so melodramatic, and then the imagery on the screen was over the top. Like you know, you've got this bit of the dog going in and out. The dog pulls a stupid face, and it's like, oh my god! Yeah. And it just made me laugh because it was so silly. It's okay. like this is supposed to be like a pivotal, pivotal, important moment, and I was just laughing at it, because it was like, this is dumb. In particular, I think the Huskies' expressions are the ones that got me the most, because yeah. they, they look so comedically evil, it's just like, come on, it's a dog. <laughs> You're expecting him to twiddle his moustache. Genuinely, there's points where he's like, properly like, furrowed his brow, and he's got his ears like, pointed that. It reminded me of the dogs in Up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, like, you, you know, the, that. um, Oh, I've got my name of that one. Is it Omega? That dog's called the like the yes. main black one. Yeah, like yeah. It, the same way that's designed. So it's like sharp points. It's sort of like Eve. It's the, it looked like we're trying to do that with a husky, but it's a photorealistic husky, <laughs> and huskies are adorable. Yeah, but also in, the, in that same now we've compared it to up. which just made me think like there are a lot of moments where I feel like the, the writers or you know whoever the directors really wanted the dogs to just talk. <laughs> You know, I'm glad they didn't. Though. I'm glad they didn't as well, but it feels like they wanted that a lot. Do you know what I mean? Sort like, of, yeah. Especially when he's doing the pack and you get the dogs like looking at each other like, oh, you know. And it's like, are all dogs just super hyper-intelligent regardless of breed? And it's like, oh. And then the narration's like, oh, and now Buck knew more than his owners. It's like, like yes, he's, we know. he's a dog. <laughs> but that's, I mean, but then this is going back to like, it's a film about dogs of the protagonist yeah. and kind of like if they were just normal dogs it wouldn't wouldn't work so it's sort of a bit of suspension of disbelief which I don't mind I just I don't know I mean you're, you you are right but I feel like it needed to do more to suspend your disbelief hmm. I, I think like... talking wouldn't have been it but no, well yeah no, I, like... I feel like they should have gone 
completely one way or completely the other, where they've got this weird mix. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I think what I did like about it was the the going back to sort of the science and the thing, the amount of detail of sort of emotion and communication they could convey with just sort of like facial movements and eyes and stuff on a yeah. dog. That was well Yeah, so I think I guess should, animated. Should yeah, commend how good the CGI was mm. at points. There were a couple points where I was it was a bit iffy. A bit rubbery, a bit elastic at points. But yeah. I think that when it was doing sort of mo- more like realistically doggy things, like sitting yeah. there, it was great. And the moment it started bouncing onto beds with the yeah. velocity of a bowling ball <laughs> was a bit more <laughs> a bit more hard to believe. Yeah, I feel like the CGI was amazing and especially the fur detail. Like a lot of it, especially towards the end, um, have you seen or you know played at Red Dead Redemption Two? Because, I've seen someone else playing it. Yeah, like the you know they've got like the photorealistic animals and stuff, and sure. it felt like they'd just taken it from there, you know, and spruced it up for a screen. Like it was it was really really well done, but it d- did still feel quite video gamey. Yeah, you know what I mean, I feel like there's almost going to be something unavoidable about the sort of the video gamey. Because especially with like modern photorealistic CGI and video games are essentially the same technology, so they're gonna yeah. advance at about the same rate. Yeah. So I feel like that's the video games can look at best like a film and vice versa at any given point. From yeah, from I now think on, you're I right. Whereas I feel like the the animals in Red Dead Redemption Two uh, feel a lot more in place. Because, because think, the humans and the, yeah. the whole world is computer generated. Exactly, because it's a consistent, the same way with animation, when it's all consistent, yeah, yeah, yeah. you just go with it. But when there's two different styles going on at once, yeah. it's more hard to believe. Which does bring us, you know, should have this should this have just been animated then? Well, maybe as an adaptation of a story, but I think it's clear overall, this, the whole point of this film was to try out whether a CG dog could work the whole thing. Because yeah. the backstory to all this was, I think it was, I think it was called A Dog's Purpose. It was a film that came out about 2017, 2018. And there was some oh. behind the scenes footage of them forcing a, a dog into water when it didn't want to go. Uh, and there's a lot of animal rights got behind this um, saying, you know, we shouldn't force dogs and other animals to do this kind of thing on film. And it's like, why can't you just CGI it? So I think this entire film was a response to be like, okay, well, let's, let's see what happens when we try to do a film about a dog. We'll take a, an old, tried and tested look yeah. that's famous and been done hundreds of times. So we've got the story and we'll just do it with a CGI dog. Mm. See what happens. And I think that's the... Ho- that's, and that, as, as that, it's, it's fine. It's a, it's a good experiment. But I don't think it's got much more to it than that. Yeah. I feel like this film will be forgotten very quickly. Yes. I think this is almost... A, a, this, this is for the, the filmmakers as much as it was for an audience. Just to see, like, yeah. does it work? I feel like it does work, yeah. and I feel like that's the future uh, over animal cruelty, obviously. Yeah. Like, but as a proof of concept, I think it's good. Yeah, I and think there the... were there were some good merits in the film. Like a lot of the sledding stuff was good. I thought, mm, other thing... than the stupid avalanche scene, but we'll get onto that. Oh, will we? Yeah, we will. <laughs> we'll get onto it now if you want. Well, the stupid avalanche <laughs> scene, Nick. It was dumb. It was oh god. Basically, they they're going over. You know what? I don't know what it is like a snow plane, and then suddenly there's an avalanche starts coming down from the mountain, and the driver, who, is, shouting, "Oh, go left, go left!" and Buck sees his spooky ghost wolf friend, and goes right instead. He goes right, and it takes him into a cave under the mountain, presumably safe from the avalanche. Although the avalanche just follows them through, and Buck has to crash through a load of sharp icicles. But, and is completely fine. That's fine. Anyway, when they get out of the cave of safety, where are they? Still in looming threat of the avalanche. <laughs> it feels like if they'd just gone left the whole time, they would have been completely fine. <laughs> and it was so dumb because it's such forced like drama. But then how are they going to sell what is clearly going to be the new Disneyland called The Wild Ride, where you get yeah. taken by sled dogs, not real sled dogs, <laughs> but like, it would be like a sort of a Star Tours style... Yeah. simulation thing where they like I, I, I watched that scene and I was like this is, I can see it on an advertising album being like come to Disneyland Florida yeah. where you can experience the dogs <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that did feel a bit it just felt so it did like, feel artificial yeah, yeah like it's sort of shoved in there but also like but it's also it's the call of the wild well, it's, his, yeah. it's his instinct showing him the way through peril but not really but not really because <laughs> yeah. it just takes him 
slightly out of peril and then back into the peril <laughs> when you could have... Won. As the frying pan into the same frying pan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you could have just been out of the way the entire time, but it's like, nope. <laughs> okay. Also, the... He's... Again, well, this is another problem with how strong is Buck, because he just smashes through these icicles and ice sheets and frozen lakes like they're nothing. <laughs> you know, he just has absolutely no problem. But then when one human holds a rope around his neck, he seemingly cannot move. <laughs> and it's like, in the scene previous to that, he is tied to a plank, you know, with screws in the wall, and he just pulls the screws out of the wall and is fine. And then the scene following that, some chump in a pub <laughs> just holds him back. And, and then they're called but... saloons. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and he can't do anything. And it's like... So, again, just inconsistency. Hmm. Inconsistency is just annoying. Again, I've said I've liked it and spent the entire time slagging well, it off. Well, again, <laughs> I mean, I think the merits of the film in terms of... It's clearly a sort of a indestructible story that's lasted all this time, you know, has that sort yes. of appeal. So I think the reason the story works is because it's, it is just a good, it's good source material. Yeah. I think it is well, well made and well directed. Yeah, there was no... Pro- like, there was... The problems I have with it aren't aren't story-based, aren't no. direction-based. I mean, there's a couple of acting things. But... There's many sort of just execution of yeah. the dog. Yeah. And that's... Uh, yeah, that's just inconsistency with the CGI over anything else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, th- I thought it was it was good overall. Yeah. I thought it was fine. I think it's not... Not really, like, you know, a must-see at all. But if, no. you've got, if you've got some kids and you want to take them, it's a fun afternoon out. Yeah. And I think if you're interested in sort of the progress of CG animation and stuff, it's also yeah. worth looking to see where we're at. See, see, now if like this compared to the Lion King, mm. this feels a lot more like this is where it should be used. Yes, because they're replacing a dog, you know, for the animal cruelty reasons, and because like the CG dog works better than a real dog would have in some cases here. Whereas in Lion King, it's just a load of old bollocks, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but then it's also interesting that this is one CG character, um, but but we both, well, I, don't, I can't remember if you liked it or not, but um, The Jungle Book, where I that's one it, yes. human character and everything else is CGI. And that's live action, inverted commas. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, yeah. We've I mean, gone I back like to this book. point because we both get triggered. Well, I mean, it. I think the other thing as well is because the, the Jungle Book is, again, that's originally a novel, nothing to do with Disney. And the, the Disney animation yeah. was just but one adaptation. Well, the, the new that one did, true. it did the same story, but did something new with it. It did a yeah. new direction. And they changed it and they expanded yeah. on some bits. Unlike The Lion King. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons. So, point. The Lion King, if they're going to do it photorealistic, do something different. Do it, could do it like Call of the Wild, the, the silent sig- uh, sequences. Yeah. And just have no dialogue, no singing, just have the drum play out like a realistic like animal just with growls and stuff make it a silent film if you're going to go that route but mm. just taking the, the exact same script as before and then just changing the animation yeah that's what annoys me about it because that's a pointless that's such a waste of resources do something interesting but I think that's why The Lion King rub, rubbed us up the wrong way so much or Jungle mm. Book was okay yeah alright awesome. tell me about Underwater then okay so Underwater uh, which is directed by William Eubank and starring Kristen Stewart and uh, Vincent Cassell of uh, La Haine really? yeah I didn't know he was in that film yeah he's, he's in a lot of stuff it's also got um, uh, is it TJ TJ Miller, Miller yeah. yes which I've heard there's a controversy yeah, about there recently, wasn't there because yeah. um, basically this film was shot in I think 2017 oh, and then because it? of the whole um, Fox and Disney merger has been yeah. on hold for ages so what's this Pre this is his scandal then. It must have been shot before that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But it's so. so I think his scandal was that he just got. He was an alcohol. Oh, he's an alcoholic or something like that, and he keeps showing up drunk on set. All right. To like Deadpool and stuff. Okay. Because I sort of I yeah. while looking researching this film, I did see occasional things being like, oh, it's interesting that T J Miller's in this film after the incident. I was like, but what? And I didn't actually get around well, to research. I've heard that. about. It. I don't know if there's anything else. Yeah. But but I feel like if he did something major, they wouldn't have released the film. Yeah, that's probably fair. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's interesting that this is the last film with the 20th Century Fox logo. Yeah. Unlike Call of the Wild, which I don't know if you noticed, had 20th Century Studios, yes, which is the new Disney yes. sort of hands. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so basic plot. I mean, it's been described as wet alien. 
in that it's alien but sat underwater. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, We're alien. Like yeah. It. Um, I mean, so, so uh, yeah, the plot is moist. <laughs> moist <laughs> alien. I have also someone. Some people have said it's actually close to the descent, but I haven't seen the descent, so I can't okay. say either way. Either. Yep. In fact, for me, it reminded me of Wet Inferno, the old Dot Two story. Not called Inferno, not not West Inferno. <laughs> West Inferno. <laughs> but so uh, yeah, so the plot is basically there's a there's a big deep sea like sort of mining rig yeah. in the Mariana Trench. They're trying to drill into the Earth's crust and find. Well, that's the thing. I'm not sure if they actually specified what they're searching for, other than just you know adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Expl- yeah, I'm presuming there's some resource. You know what they're searching for? Nick? What? The Call of the Wild. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to find it down there. <laughs> um, but which is why it reminded me of Inferno, because that also dealt with a super deep borehole into the Earth's crust that results in alien nastiness. Um, alien nastiness? <laughs> nastiness. <laughs> alien Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, continue. Yeah, my piece on. <laughs> yep. But yeah, so, of course, the, the horrors of building a, a deep underwater platform is there's a lot of pressure. And... Guess what happens? They break. Yeah. Um, actually, quite abruptly. It's interesting. The film begins, and we have, I think, I'd say two minutes, maybe three tops of Kristen Stewart just sort of wandering about, brushing her teeth, and then everything explodes. Okay. And yeah. So basically, the whole the whole base is sort of complete. You know, getting crushed and compromised, and there's only about I think of three hundred crew. There's about f- I think there's six of them left. And it's like, right, we've got to get out of here before we, do- you know, there's some escape pods over on this separate site. We've got to get out of this place, cross the ocean floor on foot and escape. Okay. So that's the basic plot. It's that very... does sound a lot like aliens. Yeah. Well, well and alien. I suppose, mm. but... Well, it's closer to alien in that sense. We've got this sort of these, this sort of main characters on this sort of isolated on this rig of mm. some kind. And it's like, you know, there's no, uh, unlike, so, you know, in Alien, there's a big thing about, like, they're basically space truckers, and the sort of the glorification of space travel is normalised, it's just this is their job, and in the same way, there's no sort of, like, oh, look how cool it is, we're underwater, it's like, this is our job, we're underwater, we're technicians, we're engineers, yeah. and it, there's that, so there's that kind of vibe to it, and it is, I mean, it is essentially a horror film, and essentially a slasher film, in the way that we've got a main cast that gets whittled down. In fact, actually, it reminds me, in some ways, of Sunshine, well, I don't know if you've seen the Danny Boyle film. I've seen bits of that film. Yeah. I haven't seen the whole thing, but yeah, um, I know what you're talking about. But in that, it's because in Sunshine, the sort of the conceit of it, at least as far as I can tell, was it was a slasher film where the killer was simply the hostility of space travel mm. until at least the weird Freddy Krueger monster appears and starts killing people, which is when it officially lost me. Which is an interesting comparison to Underwater because it starts with just the horrors of underwater exploration, but yeah. you know, people being killed by pressure locks and failing suits. And then creatures show up, mm. which I think the main, the, so my main thing in the film is it sort of gets weaker as it goes along, because when it starts and it's just simply like, you know, maybe <laughs> making a really deep undersea platform is a terrible idea, and it, you know, yeah. inherently flawed, but then it's like, oh, and here's some weird alien creatures, and it's like, well, okay, I get, because obviously there's this whole thing about, and it's going back to a cosmic horror thing, about we're on the bottom of the ocean floor, we don't know what's down there, fine, but consider... What's going to be on the bottom of the ocean floor? What are they going to look like? What incredible, you know, indes- indescribable designs are going to have? Oh, they're basically just human things. Are they? Well, you've seen you've seen the trailer. I've seen, well, I've seen the trailer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to be fair, they're only in the trailer very briefly. But there's fashion. They, you know, they've got a head and a torso, and they've got two arms of thing. They're basically humanoid. Oh, they I thought they were like big squid boys with no. mouths. No. Well, no. There's there's a sort of like a sort of squid baby they find briefly. What? <laughs> like it's the ba- the baby form of them, and we see like the adult form, which is basically. So I thought human. they were like huge. Are they not big? They are just no. Like... There's they're normal human sized. Um, I will con- I'll get back to that uh, a bit later. Okay. But so, yeah. So, in so that's basically that's the film conceptually, and in terms of what I found sort of wrong with it, because mm. at first I thought okay, it's interesting. It wastes no time getting started. Like it's it's straight in there. It's like right here's our characters. Here's the peril they're in. It's a very sort of... So going back to what I was saying about The Shadows back in my blog about when you've got a sort of a horror, horror survival film, we don't need deep backstory to understand why they want to survive and escape alive. It's a pretty straightforward thing. Sense, yeah. So I liked that it sort of got into it. But the problem is there's still... I think there's too little of it in the sense that we don't... There's no... equal no characterization. 
Well, there's no characterization, but it's also like we don't see what life was like before everything went to shit. Which you do in Alien. Yeah, in Alien, there's a yeah. solid hour before anything really happens, so we get to see what their lives are just like normally. Yeah. So we don't, we, you know, the, the emotional weight of something like this is from seeing them in the, the relatively, like, in their natural state, I mean, yeah. everything goes wrong. I mean, this one, things go wrong so quickly, we don't have any reference, you know, for as far as the audience is concerned, our entire point of reference for their world is this. Yeah. So that's just bad pacing then, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, essentially... Well, that's the thing. This is interesting because the trailer, I think it's just the way it's edited, but it implies that there's a bit, we see them enter the base and stay for a while before things go wrong. I couldn't find anything about it being cut online, but it does feel, because it's also just about 90 minutes, it feels like there is like a first act that's just missing. Okay. Which I think would have made it a stronger film, because it would have given that extra bit of context that might have made it work a bit better. Um... So yeah, so going back to the monsters, uh, one of the things about them is, the mo- as I was saying, like they're, they're basically humanoid. I think it's really rubbish that they could have done anything with design, and I went for that. I mean, sky's the limit, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but then here's... Going back to your thing about cosmic horrors, this is essentially... This is cosmic horror. Well, yeah. Um, you know, this is the the horror of what is down there, that we can... Po- you know, anything could be living that deep in yeah. the sea and would be so weird in its design I mean, it would essentially be alien yeah I mean how, uh, I mean half of what Lovecraft writes about is, is from the sea because he was for that exact reason exactly it's like no one knows what's down there because cause, you know they find Cthulhu under the sea yeah. Dagon's under the sea loads of these big spooky boys are from under the sea because he was obviously terrified of of that exact concept okay. as of what you're describing so this is going to be a bit of a spoiler. So if you do care yeah. too much underwater, scribble forward ahead. I'll put a time code in the video now. Um, but yeah, so here's the interesting thing. The creatures in this are supposed to be deep ones. Really? Yeah, I was reading about this. The director William Eubank said the creatures, the main creatures are supposed to be deep ones. They're supposed the... to be as in Cthul- yes. Lovecraftian and... deep ones. Because you mentioned there is a big one at the end, which yeah. apparently is a spoiler because it wasn't in the trailers from what I can tell. That's Cthulhu. Cthulhu what? just shows up at the end. <laughs> That's yes. This is what. But this is exactly this is this is <laughs> like I, this. I don't know if it's worth a whole spoiler corner, but like it's, this, this is the thing I don't get about it is that we have this sort of relatively grounded like oh yeah it's just because I thought it would just be like you know I <laughs> it's just the water <laughs> crushing everything. I thought it would be cool if we had just the suggestion that maybe there's something out there. Or maybe it's simply, you know, the, the, the horror of even knowing if that's what's the problem. But like, oh no, Cthulhu just sort of shows up. And do they say it, name it? No, they don't. This, I had to look it up. And they the, don't directly say, oh, no. that's Cthulhu. But I thought, hmm, he looks a bit like Cthulhu. And I was going to, I researched it because I was like, I might mention this in the podcast. Mm. And then I saw, yeah, it, it, Eubank was like, yes, it is supposed to be Cthulhu. What? <laughs> Why? But that's, but that's the thing, but also... I mean, I know we we have imagery of Cthulhu. Well, so the deep like... ones aren't from Cthulhu; they're from Dagon. So he's well, got so that wrong. Well, I, thought, I was like, surely I thought deep ones were the whole um, Innsmouth rather than Cthulhu. Separate yeah, yeah. Well, Dagon, mythologies. Yeah. yeah. So deep ones praise Dagon, who yeah. is like the god of you know. Well, that's what whatever. I thought. Um, and they just stick Cthulhu in it and have yeah. a nice time. And also, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's so random. But here's the, here's the thing. I guess what they do with Cthulhu in the end. What? They nuke him. Because <laughs> <laughs> he starts... So they get to this other drill. And, and they send... Basically, of the three escape pods left, only two are functional. So oh, Kristen Stewart obviously. sends those two off. And then she's just got Cthulhu breaking to the base. And so she sets the nuclear reactor to go into meltdown. And just nukes Cthulhu. Does it kill Cthulhu? Apparently. Well, it shouldn't. That's the, that's the thing. Because we have this massive explosion. And then it cuts to like sort of newspaper bits being like, oh, two survivors from the um, project, whatever it's called, mining site. Uh, but the CCTV's been confiscated. I and mean, then it's just credits. And like, what, you cut fright, but you can't, <laughs> you can't just nuke Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's someone who clearly hasn't understood. Yeah, that's someone who's seen the imagery of Cthulhu and is like, that looks cool. I mean, that's Let's fine, use like, it. Yeah. Use but it, without knowing what it is. I feel like they've sort of got away with it by not directly saying, yeah. this is Cthulhu and Lovecraftian. But that is someone who's obviously misunderstood what Cthulhu inherently is. And here's the thing as well, because Cthulhu, at least the, this version of it, still looks like a person. He's got like a face and a body and I, he looks like this. And he sort of wades into Does the base. No, he's got a lot of tentacles. 
ish. Right. But like, I mean, it's. But that's why I don't get like. So we're going to cosmic horror. The whole thing is it's indescribable. It's, it yeah. It just looks so bizarre. Well, it, to, to be fair, Cthulhu is one of the only elder gods, or you know, one of the only things Lovecraft does actually describe. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that has got the imagery attached to it. But then, which is fine. But like. Why would you then redesign, even do your own monster that's all like in its own way bizarre and uncanny, yeah. or don't design it to look based like a massive man? Yeah, that's. Which I found really lazy, and it's sort of it. I felt it was leaning too towards the sort of like the generic horror films where it's like sort of like yeah. they look more like ghouls kind of thing rather than like, you know, underwater creatures. Um, but yeah, also talking about the ending, it's sort of, it's, as I was saying, like it's so abrupt. It comes out of nowhere, and like, so the main character presumably dies. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, now we would like some context to know a bit more about you, but no, okay. Nope. okay. And then straight to credits, no, no real sort of like you know concluding act or sort of outro. So. Okay. Yeah, but. So, just quickly, what do you think of what did what was Christian's here like? Was she good? I thought she was really good actually. Yeah. yeah. I thought she, you know, she's essentially the Ripley character. Yeah. But I think she's, you know, she's stoic, but she's still got plenty, you know. She, she's not too tough. She's not too a Mary Sue. She is just like, you know, she's scared, but she's level headed. You know, she's, yeah. you know, she's got, she is emotional, but not too much, you know. Yeah. See, I quite like Christian Stewart. Yeah, I think, I think she's, she's actually, I think Twilight's done her badly. She's actually, she yeah. seems like quite a good actress. And I've seen her in, yeah. I think, Into the Wild as well. I'm talking the wild. There's a lot of wild <laughs> in this wild. episode. Yeah. But yeah, she's a good actor. And I think, yeah, so overall, it's a film, it's, it's, it's not a bad film, it's, it's enjoyable. And I mean, it's definitely, it's really well made. Like, the production design is on point. And the, you know, I, as a concept, with a few tweaks and just, I, you know, I think the, the monsters and the creatures shouldn't not be in it, but I think they should be reduced and made more yeah. sort of vague. So do you like the, the aesthetic of it? Yes. Because one of the, the best things, I think, of the Lovecraftian world is the aesthetic, where that's a big draw to me. Is that the of the aesthetic of it, and I think also it's interesting that they've gone for that kind of thing, but not sold it as that because that's such a yeah. good IP with mm. such a massive fan base behind it. You think they'd jump on that straight away, but I think the, I, I, I might I might be tactical though, because considering how yeah. surface level it is, it's yeah. like they've you know I feel like if Lovecraftian fans watched it wanting a Lovecraft film, they'd be slightly pissed off to say yeah. the least. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's well made. It's the, what I think it is, it's the, it's the seed of a great idea. Right. What I want is I want to see more films like this, but just stronger and all these yeah. sort of things. That I think, because, you know, Underwater is such a great setting. Uh, as in, not the film, the, the, yeah, set, yeah, yeah, the yeah. setting being underwater, like yeah. deep, it's, you know, it's basically well, the same space. Yeah, but well, I was going to more... say, like, you've played Subnautica. I've seen you play it. You've seen me play it. I'm terrified fans. of that game, yeah. But that game to me is incredible because there is nothing scarier to me than that vast, huge emptiness of the the water that anything could be in. Yeah. And realistically be in. Whereas the space, you know it's Empty. the vacuum. Yeah. But also nothing can survive in it. That's, yeah. Whereas the water, everything does live in it. And exactly. That just That's what terrifies me. You know, we've got the, the same sort of differences of pressure as a, as a, as an enemy in space. It's lack of pressure in water is too much of it, but he weighs sort of the same result. But we've also got the knowledge that there are things out there in the water when space, it is empty. Mm. So I think less, as much as I love space films, less films in space, more films underwater, especially sort of horror sci-fi things. I think underwater things work better as a game though. Well, I, mean, I, mean, well, I don't know I mean, I necessarily, think... and that might just be from the lack of films, but some water is, is brilliant. I would say it's a lack of films, because I think, I mean, that's a, I think that's more that horror works better as a game because of the interactiveness, I'd say. Yeah, but it's not just the, I mean, you could, you could, it's not just the um, horror elements that makes a Nautica so good. You know, it's, it's the different, you know, the vibrancy of some parts of the ocean versus the emptiness of other parts and I think that works really well whereas space is just just empty yeah Un underwater is a bit different well I, I don't know like I maybe I should see it although I think I think it's worth a look cause it's, yeah. yeah it's again it's not a, it's no by no means a bad film I enjoyed it but I do think it definitely it, it loses you as it goes along yeah but I think with, with a few tweaks it could be like a really solid horror sci-fi film were there any moments where you were like 
this is shit. <laughs> Mainly when I the first time it like you probably see one of the deep ones. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay, it's that film. You know, I was mm. like, he's like, I thought this was being really interesting and sort of different. It's like, oh, we've we've gone sort of generic twenty tens horror schlock. Yeah, and just from a design aspect, I just felt it was yeah. That's the main. Thing. I think the creature design is what lets it down the most. Right, and also just the presence of them at all. Yeah, but yeah, I mean that's. I feel like you've got to go with, well, not one or the other, but. Like in in Alien, you're never out of sp- the space itself. Isn't a massive threat, is it? No. Whereas the alien always is. Like the space is there, and obviously it's eventually the thing that kills the alien. But uh, with the fr- the with the thruster as well, you know what I mean. Right? I mean that's I think you're, you're reaching a bit there. <laughs> but it's not an enemy itself, is it? No, it's just sort of a. It's an environment. It's an it's a, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sort of a way of entrapping someone in a sort of in a situation. Yeah, because the in that the space serves as well. You know, space no one can hear you scream. Like they cannot get any help. Like that's the that's, that's yeah the yeah. Draw. That's what makes the space scary. Not it's the alien itself is where the horror lies, though, isn't it? Yeah, but I think in underwater. I think there's enough sort of threat from the water, being underwater itself that you could, mm. that could have just survived as the threat in itself. But again, like I like the the idea of a threat of a monster without ever clearly seeing it or knowing how much impact it's having. Yeah. I think it's all where the, the true sort of potential in this idea lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's cosmic horror. That's cosmic horror. <laughs> Did it? Did. <laughs> cool. Um... Take it away. On yeah. Fundamental. Should we do a fundamental? Yeah. Well, I've got one. So. Have you seen, well, you must have seen, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince? I've seen all of them except that. No, of course I've seen it. <laughs> okay, yeah. And have you read the book? Yes, once a, a while ago. Okay, well, I've read the book a fair, a couple of times. A couple of hundred uh, times. Yeah, a couple of hundred times, whatever. I've seen the film, I don't know, once or twice. Um, there's a bit at the end of that film that really, really annoys me. Because it completely changes Harry Potter as a character. Like, just completely changes him. Like, every aspect... Not every aspect, but his core being is completely changed by the adaptation into film. And before you continue, is this a spoiler for Harry Potter? Yes, it's a huge spoiler, but if you haven't seen it... How? (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, we've got to make sure. So, just a bit of context. At the end, it's literally... I don't know, it must be the last 20 minutes of the film, last few chapters of the book. Harry and Dumbledore have just got back from trying to find a Horcrux. Dumbledore's all weakened. They go up to the... They, they, in the book... Astronomy Tower. Yeah, in the book they fly up to the Astronomy Tower on broomsticks, and in the film they apparate up there. Wait, does Dumbledore have a broom, broomstick? Yeah, they borrow them from uh, Madame Ross Merton. I can't imagine Dumbledore on a broomstick. Well, he is. <laughs> okay. Must be more sprightly in the book. Yeah. Anyway, they're up there, and so this is is Dumbledore's death, basically, is what this is all leading up to. Now, in the book, so I'll go through the book first, and I'll change, tell you how the film changes it, and, in my opinion, ruins it, right? So in the film, they fly up to the top of the tower, because they see the dark mark, and the dark mark means someone's been murdered. So Dumbledore's like, shit the bed, let's get up there, right? They fly up there, Harry's fine, Dumbledore's like... You know, because he's drunk this potion, he's all poisoned and horrible. He's also got the arm. He's shit-based. <laughs> <laughs> he's got his cursed arm, which is, you know, very, very close to killing him, right? He's dying anyway. But he's up the top of the tower, right? Uh, when Draco Malfoy comes in with his wand out, like... And Dumbledore has a split second. He can either disarm Draco or save Harry. He chooses to save Harry. So Harry's under the invisibility cloak and uh, Dumbledore freezes him in place, you know, so he can't do anything. Yes. He then proceeds, Dumb- he, Harry then proceeds to watch Draco and all the other Death Eaters come up and eventually watches Snape kill Dumbledore, right? And Harry, the whole time, because obviously you get the insight into his head, is, you know, screaming, trying everything. He can't move. He just has to watch his mentor, his father figure get killed you know and that's terrible and very traumatic for him and he cannot do anything about it in the film 
right? And this is where it really annoys me because it just completely changes it. In the film, they apparate in, right? Dumbledore's just like, oh, someone's coming. Harry, fuck off downstairs, yeah? And Harry's like, oh, It's okay. a very streetwise adaptation of Dumbledore, you feel like it. Or right, Harry, mate, fuck <laughs> off down there. But he's like, you just do as exactly as I say, yeah? Just go downstairs and don't move. Stay quiet. Okay? So Harry goes downstairs and the same thing happens. Draco comes back up with his wand out. And now here's the first difference, which is to Dumbledore. Dumbledore gets his wand out. Draco just disarms him. But Dumbledore doesn't have the... uh, choose Harry or Draco now, he could have just instantly murdered Draco. Not murdered, well, you know, yeah. stopped him. He's supposedly the greatest <laughs> wizard of all time. Like, he could have just stopped him with ease because now he hasn't got the choice of protect or, you know, harm. Right? So that's one, but that's the minor one. The other thing is, Harry's seen someone he hates, because he hates Malfoy, it's been his... Really? But they didn't come across Well, yeah, else. exactly. <laughs> it's very it's subtle. Been his, really. his enemy... Since the first book and film, Harry still has his wand. In fact, there is a shot in that in that scene of Harry pointing his wand at Draco, but not doing anything. <laughs> if you saw someone pointing a gun at your dad, and you had a gun in your hand, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> it's so dumb. <laughs> But also then, Harry Harry's not frozen in place, yeah? He he's could, free, he's to free to move, he's free to speak, he's free to cast spells, he's free to do anything. But right? Dumbledore said not to. Exactly. And then, Snape comes up the stairs. Snape, who, you know, he's like... Snape even speaks to Harry and he's like, oh, shush, don't move. And Harry's like, okay, well, Dumbledore's already said that, but, you know. And then Snape goes up there. He then witnesses Snape, another person who he f- despises kill Dumbledore, and he does nothing again. He does nothing. You saw the <laughs> stuff was like, oh, oh no. But he has the power to stop him, and it's like, they fundamentally change it, because Harry, in the book at least, is described as like trying with every fibre of his being to protect Dumbledore, to save Dumbledore, to do anything he possibly can to help. And in the film, he's just stood there like a fucking tit, doing nothing. And it just changes it because Harry's no longer brave or the one who's like oh yeah I saw Dumbledore get killed because I couldn't protect him I couldn't do anything in the film he's just like oh yeah I saw Dumbledore get killed because lol he told me not to help ha huh. it's like Ugh. oh my god <clears throat> yeah yep. that is a fundamental That's change a right? fundamental change but they continue it there's also an even bigger fundamental change but I'll do that I'll do oh, that so I'll do that next episode. week yeah okay <laughs> yeah in the seventh book, there's loads of differences in the books to the films of Harry Potter. But then I just wanted to discuss with you why do you think they made that change? That's an interesting point. I, I have a I have a theory. You have a theory. Go on, say your theory. So in the book, he puts the cloak on him and then freezes him in place, right? Whereas in the film, he's just under the stairs, so we can see the reaction shots of Harry as you see all of this unfold. So you get that identifiable character reacting to what's on there, which is hinting to what the audience should be reacting the same in the same way. But, I mean, that changes things. But then with that, with terms of, like... Because we've seen shots in other points of the films where of Harry under the invisibility cloak. And mm. it's, it's not like you can do a reaction shot of Harry just under the cloak. Well, because he's, because he's frozen, it freezes your face as well. So, so he literally can't make a reaction face. That, that, that's, that's why mm. I think they did do it. But then, you, you, I mean, you could have some losers that say, like, maybe just his face, like, just his eye. It's like a widening of the pupils could be enough to yeah. just, like, you know. Exactly. You could see anything. I mean, but... I can but imagine, like, a shot where we see, that. like, his hands are, like, frozen. We see it's, like, just, like, shake slightly as it's trying to move. It just won't. Yeah. And we see that sort of frustration. I feel like it could be, com- it could be conveyed. It could, it could be done. Yeah. But they didn't do it. Yeah. But the other thing is, in the, in the book, he's literally right next to Dumbledore. Like, you know, a foot away from him. He, he is so close to him and he can't do anything about it. Whereas in the, in the film, he's a story below. You know, and he's a story below and he's looking up at... Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, that, that's it. It's like, but they've added that distance and I don't know why, like, 
in the book it's so much more impactful because he's so close but can't do anything he feels so trapped and it's so powerful that it, you know he can't do anything about it and you've just got to watch as he as Dumbledore dies and it's like that's so strong but I just don't know why they yeah. change it and it's annoying and it's just a terrible choice in my opinion yeah yeah. So do you think it's entirely just? I, I mean, I, can't, I can't think of any other reason other than they have they have to have a reaction shot from Harry, mainly because, I mean, what? Why wouldn't you? In in everything else, you'd have that reaction shot, wouldn't you? Yeah, I feel like there could be some interesting like, if you had the way you could block it in such a way that Harry's sort of like. So we have like, say, from behind Dumbledore, Harry's in the foreground and the action in the background. We do some sort of like combination of like a pull focus as well as sort of fading in the invisibility cloak. Yeah. I, like, I, I just feel like the way they... Obviously doing an, something, an invisibility cloak is a hard thing to pull off yeah. and have to look good. And they, they they sort of give up after the third film, you know, because it's like, hmm. you know... But it's he uses it all the time, like the invisibility cloak in the books, and they sort of fade it out in the in the uh, films as, uh, a bit but in yeah in the sixth one he you know he ha- has the invisibility cloak and it's like that would be a, I, I know but like that that would be a hard thing to show on screen and have look good mm. but the point yeah. is like there's so many different ways like there's so many options of, especially in such a CG heavy kind of like effects heavy yeah. film there are many ways they could do that in an interesting way yeah that so they work. have the budget like I yeah. feel like they could have made that work and be more impactful. Mm. And the point is that, you know, because subjectively the audience knows about the visibility cloak and knows that Harry's there. So it wouldn't hurt the immersion to see, like, essentially see him there in the invisibility cloak. And, yeah. like, you know, you know know that he's not visible to everyone else, but see him in the cloak and sort of work that out. Yeah. Anyway, that's about as much as I've got to say about that. Yeah. Oh, that was a that was an intense one. <laughs> but there's there's more that I've got to say about that especially the last uh, Harry Potter film and book. So is this this whole thing about changing Harry's character specifically from being brave sort of a bystander? Is that a common yeah. theme in these changes? Yes. Well, it's not just that. They, yes, but they, they make Harry in, in the films a lot more unlikable. I mean, like, in the in the books, he is endlessly brave. You know, he's endlessly brave, but also he's compassionate well, I don't want to say because the the other fundamental change is a really big one that, you know, ruins his character, I think, a bit. But literally in the final scene of the final book, you know, like the battle scene, there's a big change there. Like, oh, yes. I, I vaguely know. know what you're talking about. Um, I'll be for another episode then. Yeah. yeah. But um, I just feel like it changed because Harry, the one thing you assign him to is is bravery. You know that is it's his That's exactly his Gryffindor. That is his defining characteristic. Is he's always brave. He never Backs even a fight. exactly Voldemort, who is basically wizard Hitler. He still will face him one on one because he that he is brave. He will do that all the time. And in this, he just doesn't. But that just changes him so much because that just why should he be a Gryffindor? Why should he be there? Why would anyone not want to go run in and protect? Yeah, what is he, a Hufflepuff? Yeah, kind of, some kind of chump. <laughs> oh. Okay, so that's about it for this week's episode. You've been listening to Cine Rambles with Nick and Andrew. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash official and on Twitter at Cine Rambles. And for more content, you can read the blog over at cinerambles.blogspot.com. And if you'd like to get in touch, you can send us an email at cinerambles at gmail.com and you might even get read out on the show. So, you got any closing remarks? Oh, yeah, I would like to say that we're now on Spotify. We are now on Spotify, yes. Which we weren't before. No, that's a new development. So, yeah, that's good. Just search Sydney Rambles. We're downloadable the podcast. now. Yeah. <laughs> so you can hear us offline. Yeah. <laughs> we're everywhere. You can't get rid of us. <laughs> uh, so, Nick, have you got any closing remarks? Wizard Hitler and alien Nazism. <laughs> good night. <laughs> <laughs>